Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's a great pleasure for Brookings to co-host this event with uh, CSIS. It's a particular pleasure for us to meet in this wonderful space that you have. Congratulations on this fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. facility. Um, I'd like to help thank Chris and his staff, Bonnie, Nicole, and Jacqueline. I'd like to in, um, thank people on my staff, um, Kevin, Aileen, and Franklin. But it's my greatest pleasure to um, introduce um, Ambassador Lucian Shun, who is the representative um, of the Taipei Economic and um, Cultural Office. Do I have that right? Um, <laughs> representative <laughs> Office. I'm sorry. I, um, I no. It's uh, I. I had too little sleep. It's not the long name. Um, uh, Lucian is an old friend. He is a distinguished and um, prominent member of Taiwan's Foreign Service. Um, he and I first met um, some 30 years ago, but we're not counting uh, because it just reveals our age. Um, he has served both in Taipei most uh, uh, prominently as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he has represented uh, the ROC in um, um, Belgium and also to the European Union at that time. He was um, representative in London, and now we are fortunate uh, to have him here in Washington, um, working to uh, build and enhance um, U.S. relations uh, with Taiwan. Um, it is only right and proper that uh, he um, kick off our meeting today, um, but it's also proper because uh, he is a font of historical knowledge. He is really Taiwan's historical memory and institutional memory, um, and uh, so it is uh, a great uh, honor for me to uh, welcome Lucian and ask you to join me in welcoming here. Thank you. Last time, a few months ago, we did a reverse way. Richard, remember, you went to Oxford University, and I, I did, did an introduction, introduction about, about you. you. And, and then, then I, I told the audience, audience, I said, you better, better not, not let, let me continue, continue because if, if I continue introducing Dr. Dr. Richard, Richard Bush, Bush, I would, I would have, have become, become the keynote, keynote speaker, speaker, and, and he, he would end, end up doing, doing discussion. discussion. <laughs> Ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, we really, we really want, want to thank, thank you and thank, thank the CSIS, CSIS and Brookings for hosting this event. event. Let, Let me, tell me tell you, this is probably the 14th event in commemoration of the 35th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, TRA. If I may, <coughs> excuse me, if I may recount how many activities we already have had, starting with two hearings, on the Hill, one on the Senate side and on the House side. One resolution later turned into a legislation, and then one reception on Capitol Hill, and one dinner hosted by me at Twin Oaks, one joint letter by 52 senators to President Obama urging the President to expand dialogue with Taiwan and to continue to support Taiwan's freedom, democracy, and economic prosperity and then one video conference chaired by my good friend here, and also we had the pleasure of President Ma talking to us through electronic means. And then we have six seminars, including this one. I don't know how many more we still have, but if we keep going like this, we'll go right into the celebration of 36th anniversary without a break. But it also shows how important Taiwan Relations Act is. And um, I'm so happy that uh, President Ma pointed out this morning, I think my first job is trying to follow up with the conclusion of President Ma's talks the other day, when in the conclusion he said, with admission to the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and RCEP, a top priority for my administration. I hope on this anniversary of the TRA, 
that the United States will join us in this effort. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are very delighted and very grateful that the United States responded in kind. Actually, before that, the uh, US already indicated, indicated it's welcome to Taiwan's interest in joining TPP as expressed by the Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs, Mr. Daniel Russell, and his deputy, Kim Moy, you know, when they gave the testimonies on Capitol Hill, respectively, on the Senate and the House side. This morning, I want to tell you, really, why Taiwan deserves a place in TPP. And then, without Taiwan, it's unthinkable that TPP would be formed. And then, if without Taiwan, it really would be detrimental, not only to the interests of Taiwan, but the interests of the United States and the interests of the rest of members of TPP. If I may use the most updated trade figures just put out by the Census Bureau of the United States Department of Commerce to tell you now Taiwan is no longer the 12th largest trading partner of the United States. Taiwan being up by one place, Taiwan is number 11 now, according to the figures for the first quarter of this year. Now, I always love to ask, now who is the one ahead of Taiwan and who is the one behind Taiwan? My dear friends, the one ahead of Taiwan is Brazil. Now, you know how big Brazil is. Population-wise, they are nine times the size of Taiwan's population. They are about 206 million, we only 23 billion. Territorial-wise, my dear friends, they have 6.6 .6 million square miles. They are 230 times the size of Taiwan, but they are only a little bigger than Taiwan as a trading partner to the United States. So they are number 10, we are number 11. After us is Netherlands, and you know how advanced Netherlands is and how old it is as a trading power. After that was India. You know how big India is. Population-wise, they exactly 50 times, five zero. They have 1.5 billion, we have 23 million. Now, if you let Taiwan join TPP today, TPP today has about 12 participants. Taiwan would have been the fifth largest economy, bigger than more than two thirds of it. If someday TPP be expanded to cover all the Pacific Rim countries, which is about 50 of them, Taiwan would still have been the eighth largest among the 50s, because the difference would only be as I said, Brazil is ahead of Taiwan, and then South Korea would have been ahead of Taiwan, and mainland China would have been ahead of Taiwan. So if someday, if the TPP be succeeded to cover all the Pacific Rim countries, Taiwan would have been the eighth largest. We'd be bigger than more than 80% of the TPP members. Now, do we deserve a seat in the TPP? As I said, when I was in EU, I usually tell my European friends, I said, if you let Taiwan join the European Union, we would have been the ninth largest economy among the 27 that time, bigger than two thirds of EU member states. We're going to be a little smaller than Switzerland, uh, than uh, Sweden, but we're bigger than Austria between these two. Now, this is only the quantity. Let me talk about quality. I still remember David, my classmate, we remember in our primary school, our textbooks taught us that top four Taiwan export products were bananas, sugar, rice, and tea. My friends, today, the top four Taiwan export items are IC, LCD, liquid crystal display telephones, and the semiconductor devices. That's how much Taiwan has changed. That's what kind of trading partner Taiwan is. So I would say that excluding Taiwan, totally it'd be irrational, unreasonable, and it'd be de detrimental to the interests, not only to the people of Taiwan, but the people of the United States, and the people of the rest of the TPP member countries. 
Now, of course, today, a lot of things are not just made in Taiwan. They're probably made in China, but by Taiwan investors. And this is why I think there's one more reason for Taiwan to be included in TPP. Now, as Dr. Richard Bush said, I spent many years in Europe. After I left here 11 years ago, I was uh, chief of mission in Geneva, and I was uh, transferred to Brussels as ambassador to, or representative to EU and Belgium. And then I was called back to be the deputy foreign minister, and then I was transferred to London to be the representative to the United Kingdom, also to the EBRD, European Bank of uh, Reconstruction and Development. Now, if you think there's something it's unusual, unusual in my, my accent, accent, it's, it's just, just because, because I just, I just transferred, transferred from, from London. London. <laughs> uh, you like, you like it? it? Very, Very good. good. Now, now, coming, coming from, from London, London and, and having, having spent, spent so many years, years in Europe, Europe I would, I would introduce the European model, model to, to evaluate, evaluate the situation, situation across, across the Taiwan, Taiwan Strait. Strait. I would, I would say, say today, today probably a, a better, better word, word it's probably, probably not perfect, perfect the better, better word, word of a more, more suitable word, word, word to, to describe, describe the situation, situation across, across Taiwan, Taiwan Strait. Strait. It's neither like unification, independence, or whatever, or whatever but, but integration. integration. I think, I think we've, we've been seeing economic, economic social, cultural, cultural integration. integration between two, two sides, sides of Taiwan, Taiwan streets, be moving, moving on, on so fast and, and to, to the benefit of the people, people on both sides of Taiwan, Taiwan Street. And, and um, through, through very, very careful, careful management, management and, and US, US support, support, I would, I would say, say in this integration, integration process, process that, that Taiwan, Taiwan sometimes could get some upper hands and at least some equal footing. i give you a few examples. For example, I don't know whether you know this or not. Before President Ma came to office six years ago, there were zero direct flights between two sides of Taiwan Strait. Today, there are 1,656 direct flights a week between two sides of Taiwan Strait, and we're flying to 64 Chinese cities or destinations. And Taiwan has become the largest origin of external flights into mainland China. We just outnumber Hong Kong. Hong Kong flying to only 50 cities. We're flying to 64 Chinese cities. What does it mean? It means we have probably the best access to mainland China. And uh, let me clarify something. You'll probably see in some of our materials saying that every week we have 828 direct flights. My dear friends, this time, only about 10 days ago, I was in Taipei. I checked with Taipei's Hai Jihui, Straight Exchange Foundation, and they told me the way they count the flights as a round trip. But actually, by international standard, you know, outbound is one flight, inbound is one flight. So actually, you have to time two, because 828 times two is 1,656 flights a week. Now, this is aviation shipping. My dear friends, can you imagine that mainland China altogether has opened 72 harbors for Taiwan ships? Most of them are not international harbors, starting from Dandong. Where's Dandong? Dandong is in the mouth of Yalu River, and where's Yalu River? It's a border river between China and North Korea. All the way down to Sanya. Where's Sanya? Sanya is South China Sea. And then 72 harbors include 17 river harbors along the Yangtze River, excuse me, along the Yangtze River. I was half-jokingly told a British diplomat when this agreement was made, I said, we virtually revived your ancestors' rights to have this navigation rights along the Yangtze River, because in old days only the British ships can go into Yangtze River. And then I told him the last ri river uh, harbor is called Chenlingji. Where's Chenlingji? Chenlingji is at the mouth of Dongting Lake. That's joined of Dongting Lake and the Yangtze River. It's already 2,000 kilometers inland of China. And this British diplomat is so funny. He called me back the next day. He said, you didn't get the two harbors that my ancestors got. 
they are deeper. <laughs> he is right. They are Wan Xian in Sichuan and Chongqing. And then I said, it's not because I, we didn't get it, it's because they built a three gorge dam there. <laughs> that part of Yangtze River is no longer suitable for big ships. Now, having said that, I think you can tell that I dare to say the rise of China is a given fact. But Taiwan probably has the best gateway to the rise of China. And I want you to keep in mind, I'm probably a little daring, but I want to keep in mind, there are three largest for Taiwan, which, is, which are Taiwan is the largest single external source of investment into China. I think we dare say that, because you took, look at the Taiwan business, sometimes we don't even know how much money they put in, because sometimes they go through the third countries or third places. And you, you take Foxconn as an example. One company, Foxconn, Honghai, has created more than one million jobs in mainland China. So we are the largest single external source of investment into China. I didn't say foreign, external. And then we also the largest single source, at largest single external source of knowledge about China. Right? We know them because we used to be one. We share the same history, same culture, same language, almost same everything except for the political partition. And then we also are the largest single external source of influence over China. You look at the Chinese people, how much they interest in our political elections. You look at the people, the tourists from mainland China, how much they enjoyed our political talk shows during the prime time when they visit Taiwan. You look at people in mainland China, how much they want to have a Taiwanese or Republic of China passports because we enjoy 136 visa-free countries or territories to travel to. And I don't know how many for them. Yeah, apparently, we're much, much more than them. And then, if we combine them together, I think you would find Taiwan would be a great asset for the United States in the American rebalancing Asia strategy. But I have to emphasize, all this would not have been possible without the Taiwan Relations Act. This is why the Taiwan Relations Act is so important. This is why I think we need to make this commemorate activity and telling the younger generation and telling the rest of the world we played a historical milestone here. And then, if I may, I would like to quote President Ma again in his televised speech when he said the ROC, the Republic of China and the US, uh, relations are now the strongest they have been in the last 35 years. With U.S. support, with U.S. support, Taiwan has been able to improve its cross relations and conf confidently engage Beijing from strength, a position of strength, improve cross-strait relations and confidently engage Beijing. This is how important you are. And we're very glad to note that Americans also noted this kind of situation. As it was said by, again, Assistant Secretary Daniel Russell in his Senate testimony. He said, we very much welcome and applaud the extraordinary, the extraordinary progress occurred in the cross-strait relations under President Ma's administration. Extraordinary progress. And here we seem confidently engaged. I hope you can see the corresponding uh, situation between these two. Now, in conclusion, I would say let's hope and let's keep it going, this kind of good coordination and cooperation. And together under the TRA, I think, or even with full implementation or even expansion in the TRA, I hope we can create a win-win-win situation, which is to the benefit of not only the people in Taiwan, but also the people in mainland China 
and also the people of the United States of America. Thank you very much. That's we did, I know. <laughs> Guess I'm here. Oh. Chris. Yes. Can you hand me the book? No. The other Chris. Okay. Other Chris, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Absolutely. Ambassador Shun, uh, for those illuminating and inspiring remarks. Um, we now turn to our first panel, which is a look back. Um, historical examination. We have three outstanding people uh, to provide that perspective. Um, two of my colleagues on the podium are on the stage are, um, were in effect present at the creation of the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, Carl Ford to my immediate left uh, was working for Senator Glenn at that time who was instrumental on the Senate side. Uh, Chris Nelson uh, to my far left. Uh, no. Nothing intended. No metaphor necessarily, <laughs> although I did go to Berkeley, so. Um, <laughs> it's, um, was working for Congressman Lester Wolf, who was the chairman of the uh, Asian and Pacific Affairs Subcommittee of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the House of Representatives. And to my right is my good friend and former colleague, David Lee, um, who, if you don't know it, has written the best book on the making of the Taiwan Relations Act. That's the title of it and it provides a very clear and detailed account of what happened on a day-to-day -day and week-by-week -week basis uh, during that period. Um, so we're very happy to have uh, these three perspectives, Senate, House, and Taiwan. Um, let me start by setting the scene. Um, the date is um, December 15th in the United States and uh, the morning of December 16th in the United States. Um, Jimmy Carter goes on television to announce um, uh, the normalization of relations with the People's Republic of China. Um, the joint communique, President Carter's official statement, and then various background briefings um, uh, made clear that uh, the United States was uh, ending its diplomatic relations and mutual defense treaty with uh, the Republic of China and thereby terminating its recognition of the government of the Republic of China as the government of China. Um, the United States on January 1st would establish diplomatic relations with the PRC and recognize it as the sole legal government of China. Um, U.S. ties with Taiwan, or uh, in the term of art, the people of Taiwan, would be unofficial through non-government um, uh, means. Um, the U.S. said arm sales were, would continue, but um, Chairman Hua Guofeng's statement in Beijing on the morning of the 16th uh, made clear that uh, China disagreed with this uh, position and uh, that it had gone ahead with uh, normalization in spite of this. Um, this uh, whole series of events uh, took a lot of people by surprise. Um, uh, it was said uh, later that there were only five people in the U.S. government and two in our embassy or our liaison office in Beijing uh, who had the full story of what was going on. Um, the media, um, which broadcast uh, Carter's uh, announcement, um, didn't know it was coming. Um, President Carter, in fulfilling the, um, or in completing the process of normalization, had acted with as much secrecy as Richard Nixon had uh, employed in starting the process. Um, a lot was unclear at that time. You know, first of all, what did terms like the people of Taiwan really mean? It's a term of art, obviously, but it has to have some content. The United States, uh, by these announcements, had recognized the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal government of China. Did that and a companion statement mean that we had recognized that Taiwan was part of China or part of the PRC? 
Um, and although um, President Carter stated that the United States had a continuing interest in the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue, what was the United States prepared to do to act on that interest now that we had uh, or we're in the process of terminating the Mutual Defense Treaty. And frankly, just how would these unofficial relations occur? Um, it was clear, it uh, became clear, that legislation was going to be needed uh, to make that happen. The administration had prepared uh, a draft bill that focused very much on um, uh, institutional concerns, creating the um, authority for uh, an entity that became the American Institute in Taiwan to um, interact with, quote, the Taiwan authorities um, on behalf of, quote, the people of the United States. Um, uh, there was also a need to um, ensure that agreements already existing with Taiwan would uh, continue, um, but very little uh, was said about policy. Um, a lot happened in the days that followed. Um, on, from December 18th to December 22nd, the third plenum of the 11th uh, Congress of the Communist Party was held in Beijing, and that um, announced and locked in the policy that we now know of reform and opening up. Um, after Christmas, um, Warren Christopher, the Deputy Secretary of State, arrived in Taipei, he was met by a mob of 10,000 people throwing eggs and other uh, assorted implements of protest. Um, in his conversations with um, Taiwan officials, um, Secretary Christopher discovered that uh, Taiwan was trying as hard as possible to preserve as much officiality in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship as possible. On January 1st, um, the PRC began a peace offensive um, through a, an announcement by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, and the content uh, was the, were the early seeds of what we now know as the one country, two systems formula. And then on January 3rd, um, the 96th Congress of the United States convened, and that's where we pick up our story. Um, and I think I'd like to start with Carl, since you were working in the Senate, uh, the senior body of our Congress. And uh, then we'll turn to Chris. I'll take that. Richard is a former House. <laughs> I, I'm, you, of all people, should not. Please, go ahead. <laughs> Carl? Uh, well, let me begin by explaining why I was actually there when the Taiwan Relations Act was written. Uh, I was not then, or, or am I now, an expert on Taiwan. My background was as a China military analyst, uh, first at DIA and then at CIA. And uh, I had been to Taiwan three times previously, uh, one uh, as a CIA officer, uh, twice uh, to brief President John Jinhua on uh, PLA developments, uh, and uh, once uh, as part of a research project uh, eventually turning out to be a paper that, uh, that was titled something like uh, China's Ability to Take Taiwan by Force. Uh, that, about the time that paper was uh, published, I found out I was, was CIA's representative to the Foreign Affairs Congressional Fellowship Program. And so I ended up with an internship uh, with Senator John Glenn of Ohio, who was the chairman of the East Asia Subcommittee, uh, who everything I learned about the Senate and, the, and how Washington operates, I, I learned from Senator Glenn. And uh, he, he certainly changed my life. Uh, I'll always be forever grateful to him. Uh, but uh, I then uh, stayed on uh, after my internship for five more years uh, as Glenn's rep on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, uh, on the East Asia Subcommittee. Now, uh, the, uh, the Congress was much different then, uh, certainly from the way it is now. There was an element of distrust that you could cut with a knife. I mean, this was a Congress that was still uh, reeling from the Vietnam War. Uh, almost an everyday conversation on the Foreign Relations Committee 
was War Powers Act uh, and how to restrain the executive branch and the president from doing anything. And so uh, in the summer, in the Senate, uh, and then later the full Congress in September of 78, had put into a congressional resolution uh, their sort of uh, trust uh, and sentiment about the executive branch. And I, I, if I might read just section B, it says, in the sense of, it's the sense of the Congress that there should be prior consultation between the Congress and the executive branch on any proposed policy changes affecting the continuation of, in force of the Mutual Defense Treaty of 1954. So, uh, as far as they were concerned, uh, they had spoken and of course the executive branch would hear them uh, and that there would be some sort of consultation. And uh, so on mid-December, uh, Senator Glenn called Roy Werner, who his, was his right-hand man and longtime Foreign Relations Committee staff member, and I over to his office. And he said, listen guys, I found out there's going to be a uh, the president's going to make a, a, a very important announcement today, and I don't know what it is. Let's talk about it and see what we come up with, and, and so I'm prepared uh, when the announcement is made. So we discussed it, and I think the first issue that came up was the Arab-Israeli dispute. The Secretary of Defense was, at, uh, Secretary of State was out in the region, and we thought, well, maybe he was going to come back, and, and uh, was, they were going to make some announcement about that. Or it could be SALT too. Now, uh, we did talk about China normalization. But quite frankly, uh, since the chairman of the East Asia Subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee <laughs> didn't have a clue uh, what was happening, we thought it was improbable uh, that it would be about China normalization. Well, surprise. Uh, that's what it was. And it was a surprise, certainly, uh, to, to the committee uh, and the senators. Uh, and it set the stage for everything that followed after, uh, that the president paid a heavy price uh, for that surprise. I mean, even an hour's advance notice to a lot of people would have made a big difference. Uh, and, but it, it, there was a certain, from then on, there was an adversarial relationship between the committee and, uh, and, and the executive branch. And so uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Roy and I got called back. And Senator Glenn said, would you like to go to China with me? <laughs> well, of course. Both of us had been studying China and interested in Asia our, our, our entire lives. And so uh, no one had really been to China much then. So it was a great opportunity. And uh, Senator Sam Nunn, who was chairman of the Armed Services Committee at the time, had asked Glenn to go along with him and Senator Gary Hart uh, and Senator William Cohen uh, uh, on a trip to China and Korea. Uh, interestingly, uh, the the uh, Navy Captain John McCain, uh, now Senator John McCain of Arizona, was the senior Navy liaison to the Senate uh, and organized and accompanied us on the trip. Uh, there are two, two things, that, the two uh, sort of memorable things about that trip. Uh, the first one was when we pulled up to what was called the Beijing Hotel. Uh, and it had been Senator Glenn's BOQ when he had been a pilot, uh, a P-51 pilot, for the Marshall Mission in China. He had stayed there in Beijing and had been in that, that hotel. Uh, well, I, we went up and it been a long flight. I got, took a shower and, and I had a hair, hair dryer and I turned it on and all the lights went out. <laughs> <laughs> I walked out, opened my door to see Senator Nunn, <laughs> Senator Hart, Senator Cohen and Senator McGlynn going, what happened? What happened? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so the second memorable thing, more seriously, was the meeting with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and the senators, in every way they could, were trying to get Deng to say, give them assurances that, he, that China would not use force against Taiwan. I mean, that was, that was the central issue for most of them. And they tried every way they could to pin him down. And he was really sort of doing sort of rope-a-dope. Uh, and finally, at the end, uh, after every senator had tried and, and, and failed to actually get him to say much, uh, almost it seemed an exasperation. He said, oh, don't worry about this so much. We're going to deal with this like we would deal with Hong Kong. And 
Tibet. Oh, oh my God! Very <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I would Tibet. You put that with all go. The Congress, uh, the senators, all went out, and they must not have caught that because when they went outside, all of them remarked about, and they're going to do it. They're going to treat Taiwan like Hong Kong, and there was a, all, they, they were happy about that. Well, obviously, China was telling us the truth from the very first day, uh, and we just didn't quite catch it. Um, now, when we came back, uh, we immediately were into the Taiwan Relations Act debate. And we found out very quickly at headcount that a majority of the committee was in favor of normalization of relations with China, Democrats and Republicans. It, it, it was, uh, there were a few Republicans led by Senator Helms that were uh, altogether opposed to normalization. Uh, and there were a few uh, Democrats who were very much supportive of the administration's position. But there was this middle group, Senator Glenn, Senator Stone, the Florida, uh, Chairman Church, uh, Jacob Javits uh, from New York, who was the ranking member, uh, Charles Percy from uh, uh, Illinois. Uh, that sort of group of people were the one that sort of very quickly became the center of drafting of the bill. Uh, the others had a role to play, but because they had such uh, they were out of step with the rest of the committee. Uh, they lost much, much of control over what happened. And for, I think, much like the House side, uh, the Senate side, Church and Javits, from the very beginning, said, this won't do. We don't like what the administration has done. And in fact, even the people that were supportive of the administration were surprised and concerned. There was no mention of any military relationship uh, in the, the original bill. Uh, it was an obvious uh, omission, uh, particularly since we had just uh, walked away from a defense treaty. So uh, they tore up essentially the bill and started from scratch, brought in their own experts, lawyers and from various places and started this long uh, process of writing the bill. Uh, it ended up, uh, uh, you know, the major issue was that there were a lot of legal issues about trade and, and various things, but it all was centered on security, at least on the Senate side. And how far or how close they would come to the wording of the Mutual Defense Treaty, or if they would do something less ascendentary. Uh, clearly, they wanted to just walk right up to that wording that had been originally in the treaty, uh, and, but they, in, in the end, backed down a little bit from that. Uh, but in that process, uh, they, in their discussions among themselves and in their discussions with the executive branch people that were, they were inter interfacing with, they made it clear that on arms sales and in security relationship, they were expecting to develop and build a special relationship like no other. Uh, their vision was that since this was a brand new deal for trade, for economy, uh, for all kinds of relations, that it would also be a new deal for arms sales. And the reason was because uh, if you do arms sales like uh, normal, uh, you are presented with a fait accompli. Uh, and very few, if any, uh, major arms sales are ever defeated. Uh, there are a few that are fought over, like arms sales to F-15s to Saudi Arabia, or AWACS to Saudi Arabia, something like that. But once they present that arms sale list to you, it's almost a done deal. Knowing that, the committee said, we don't want that. We, we, we just don't want that. And so uh, they made it clear that they thought they were putting together something where there would be much closer consultation between the, the executive branch and, and the Senate. Now, this came to a head the, the year after the passage of the bill when, uh, as, as you all know, there was supposed to be the first arms sale after normalization. And uh, Senator Church was saying, well, wh I wonder, what's, why haven't they consulted with us? <laughs> and so he called over the assistant secretary, and he said, Dick Holbrook. That's, that's right. <laughs> I, no names. <laughs> uh, but he, he, he mm -hmm. called the assistant secretary over, and uh, he said, what's up? I thought we had made it clear to you uh, that we want to have a special relationship on putting together this arms sales list to Taiwan. 
And my understanding through the grapevine is that you guys are already well along and almost have a fait accompli. Uh, and uh, the assistant secretary, I think unwisely, uh, it started to, ex to interpret the Taiwan Relations Act to the chairman of the Foreign <laughs> Relations Committee. Uh, and uh, his face turned razorback red, cardinal red. Uh, <laughs> steam was coming out of his ears. And he basically said, well, hold, stop. Uh, I'm sorry, but don't tell me what I meant when we wrote the Taiwan Relations Act. We wrote it, and I'm telling you what we meant. And he said, I want your people over here uh, to, today uh, to coordinate and consult with us on this RCEL list. Okay? Well, Roy and I were the only two. At that time, there wasn't a Republican or Democratic staff. It was just one staff. And so uh, Roy and I were the two, two people that they came over to see. And obviously, it was just uh, a, 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 the minimum consultation. But at least they went through the, 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 the process of doing it. And it, it at least got church off their back. Now, what had happened and why there was such a difference is that at the, at, after the bill was passed, had gone uh, the final passage. There is a set. There's a part of the process where their technical issues are handled by lawyers from state, and it's usually to make sure that things are not uh, against the U.S. law that's already written. And it's not a. It, it, there's supposed to be nothing to be policy changes in there it, because very few senators show up. Uh, they're very mostly a staff function. Well, in that process, there was wording to the effect, and I can't remember the exact words, that arms sales will be according to U.S. law. And for those people there, rookies like me, I, I, was, a, I was a congressional staffer for about six, six weeks, you know, uh, that that meant that since we were writing a law about arms sales, that obviously that would be under the U.S. law. State Department interpreted that as being the old, old way of doing it. So now, reference to the arms control, ex arms that's right. export control. Defense assistance, where that was going to be changed. Just like we'd sell something to Saudi Arabia or to Japan, we'd sell something like Taiwan. It's the only case in which we were treating Taiwan as a country, by the way. Uh, and uh, so that particular issue was to dog the relationship with China and the Congress and the executive branch uh, for ever since. Uh, and it was all over a misunderstanding of what the committee intended and the fact that Senator Church left uh, right after this. And so the second time around, he wasn't there to protect the interest. And it, apparent, it, it obviously wasn't as great an interest to others that some of the committee had changed. A lot of people weren't even on, uh, involved in the Taiwan Relations Act debate, had come onto the committee. So uh, from then on, uh, they had to deal with people like me who remembered uh, <laughs> and always tried to bring up that fact. But uh, that, that at least is my recollection of those early years of, of the Taiwan debate. Final thought, they realized that they were doing something brand new and were not certain at all that it would work. They were terribly afraid that it wouldn't work. And they wanted to do right by Taiwan. Uh, because even though they wanted to be normalized relations with China, they were almost unanimous in saying, but not at the expense of, of Taiwan. And I almost forgot that. One interesting person was Senator Pell. He would have ex been expected to be full force behind the administration. Well, it turns out, he was the most vocal, passionate supporter of the native Taiwanese. Uh, and he made a, uh, a floor statement uh, or a statement at the committee uh, that was very passionate. Uh, he was always on the side of the center uh, against the administration. Uh, and people didn't realize that during World War II, uh, he had been trained uh, to be a, a State Department civil administrator who would have gone into Taiwan uh, if we had taken the island back from Japan. And he learned the native Taiwanese dialect, and all of his studies, the instructors, were Taiwanese nationalists. And so that for all the time that he was in, in the Senate, when he thought about Taiwan, uh, he called it 
Formosa. He never would call it Taiwan. Uh, he never would recognize that it was the Republic of China. And his total focus was on, on, on the native Taiwanese. Okay, thank you. That's very revealing. That's fascinating. I completely Chris? forgot about Pels. Well, uh, uh, that, Carl has just saved me a, a lot of trouble because uh, when uh, Bonnie and Richard and Chris asked me to, to, to speak, I was, you know, Dan, if I can remember what the Senate did, they were mainly a pain <laughs> in the ass. But, but uh, 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 Carl wasn't, of course. Uh, let me set the scene just a bit, too. Um, on the House side, uh, thanks to Chairman Wolf, uh, and a Codell Wolf in the summer of 78, uh, we were actually much more plugged into probably what maybe was coming down than they were. It was a little bit harder for Holbrook uh, to hide from us because uh, uh, in late June of 78, uh, Codell Wolf, uh, 15 members and wives, very bipartisan, arrived in Beijing, and like all House members, we said, hey, we want to meet with Deng Xiaoping. And the Chinese said, you're House members. He doesn't meet with House <laughs> members. He only meets with senators. Well, to their enormous surprise, he did want to meet with House members, and there was a reason. He wanted to lecture us about Vietnam and how you couldn't trust those Vietnamese and how you, he didn't want us to normalize with them, which, believe it or not, Holbrook had been, had been talking to them about. Uh, but he wanted to get going on, on normalization. And he understood that Taiwan was in the middle of this somehow. Uh, so we had a two-hour meeting with Deng Xiaoping. And I was the note taker. And I can still read the notes, which is astonishing to me. Uh, the first hour was on the big bear and the little bear. And how you Americans are naive and they just play you for fools. And at the end of that first hour, I turned to the chairman. I said, I, I don't think he wants us to normalize the Vietnam. And he said, yeah, I think I got that. Uh, the, the second hour was on Taiwan. And he really did say, we can wait 100 years on that. He talked a lot about arms sales. He wanted us to cut out the arms sales. But he made uh, a, a lot of the representations that callers reminded you. So, so that's a scene setter. We were a little bit more plugged in. Uh, when we got back, Chairman Wolf, uh, our late and wonderfully uh, great staff director, Ed Palmer, and I actually briefed Cy Vance and Dick Holbrook. And then I went over to the White House and briefed Mike Oxenberg, whom uh, I think we all miss to this day. So, so again, for better or for worse, very involved in it as as a note taker. Uh, my qualifications, I was a damn good press secretary. Uh, I had studied some China in grad school at McGill. I had studied Chinese history as an undergraduate at, at Berkeley. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, as director of civil aviation in Hong Kong, had built the first Kai Tech airport, but that ain't why I got the job on the Asia Subcommittee. I got it because I was a very good press secretary. Uh, that's how Capitol Hill works. Uh, but uh, I started off on the committee in early 77. So uh, the first thing I did actually was call over to the Library of Congress and, and get in touch with Bob Sutter and say, now what the hell do I do? So uh, uh, I had some background, uh, and we'd had a couple of trips by then. Uh, I had the briefings. I had security clearance, uh, which still to this day gives my friends at the CIA a quiet chuckle. Uh, uh, so so that, that was the thing. Uh, towards... Uh, uh, the middle of the day of, I believe it was December the 15th, uh, uh, Lester, uh, Chairman Wolf, figured out there was something up. And he called Holbrook. He said, Dick, what the hell's going on? And Holbrook said, Lester, I can't tell you. I'll just say, watch this six o'clock news, OK? So we kind of knew what the president was going to say. But uh, Holbrook wouldn't tell us. And we'd been into, you know, at that point, we'd been intimately involved. So fast forward to uh, January 1st, uh, which was officially de-recognition day, right? We, uh, there was another Codell. This was in the days when Codells uh, uh, actually mattered because we still had enormous military sales and enormous aid programs all over Asia. And you really did have to go out and, and make sure the money was being spent wisely. So it wasn't. Uh, Contrary to what my friend Al Kamen writes, they weren't just junkets. They were, they were, they were interesting, important trips. And we were on one of our regular uh, tour and were due to arrive in Taipei on the first, on de-recognition day. And the State Department was terrified because of what had happened to, to uh, uh, Christopher. Uh, and they uh, uh, were absolutely convinced we were going to get mobbed and, and, and trouble would ensue and they'd have to clean it up. Uh, so they, they got us a bus with wire mesh on the windows. I mean, it would look like a, you know, an armored personnel carrier. 
but what state didn't realize was that, that the, the Taiwan government and our friends there knew exactly who their friends were and exactly what role the, the Chinese, uh, that we were going to play because of the earlier resolution on, on, on keeping the arms sale. So we were greeted like conquering heroes as the people who would be saving Taiwan. And it was, it was a, heady, a heady lesson for members of Congress to be treated that way. Uh, and I think uh, whether the State Department learned something or not, I don't know. Uh, but um, let's move forward a bit. Um, Carl, I think, has set the scene. Uh, the, the mistrust, which was in many ways well earned, was an enormous problem. Uh, my recollection is that uh, there was a, there was three major battles that that took place over over the, in, uh, the next few months. Uh, initially, uh, the battle was really the old Taiwan lobby fighting and losing its last battle with Red China, with Communist China. You know, that was sort of the first uh, uh, focus uh, and, a, and a lot of lobbying uh, by the old uh, Taiwan lobby took place. Uh, the second uh, uh, major group, and I think Carl has, has pointed this out, is uh, in many ways most members of Congress and most uh, members of the Senate, they were really interested in China. There was an allure to China. You know, the Gang of Four had only been gone a couple of years, and if you'd had a chance to go to China, it was pretty <coughs> exotic still. Everybody's wearing their Mao jackets, and if they had a bike, they were damn glad. And they were still looking over their shoulder because you didn't really know that we were gonna have another reversal. So there was, it was a fascinating place. Even if you were very, very anti-communist, you were interested in this place, China. So uh, we all kind of wanted to get going with the Chinese. Uh, that, wasn't a, that wasn't the debate. Uh, the debate was, of course, how are you gonna do it? The third major thing, and again, Carl has, has, has very well, uh, our friends at the State Department, uh, they wanted to do China normalization, period and anything to do uh, with Taiwan or anything else that might complicate that, make life difficult, they were against it. And uh, uh, I think Warren Christopher went to his grave not getting it, uh, quite frankly. Uh, he was very opposed to anything to do with, uh, with the arms sale that became the, the central thing. Uh, Dick Holbrook uh, was very opposed to the arms sales, uh, really, uh, for quite a bit of the debate, but Dick was nothing if not a really good politician. And he finally figured out, okay, this is the price we're gonna have to pay if we want normalization. Uh, so that, that was critical. But those, uh, those were sort of the, the main, uh, uh, the main uh, battle line uh, contestants. Uh, something else we need to remember, and this is a, a little bit unpleasant and sensitive, but you know, in those days, Taiwan wasn't the Taiwan that we know and love. It was not a democracy. It was still, in many ways, a repressive military dictatorship. It was a little bit scary. There were people being thrown off buildings in L.A., you know. Uh, and the old Taiwan lobby, if you were in the media or if you were a liberal human rights <coughs> activist, you weren't too thrilled about the old Taiwan lobby. And Taiwan money was not seen as entirely on the up and up, very much like South Korean money in those days. Uh, and that was, an, that was an obstacle, it was, it was a difficulty uh, for trying to work uh, for and with Taiwan. I mean, I, you know, it, it, you can't argue counterfactuals, but if Taiwan had been a functioning democracy back then, would we, what would have happened? You know, you, I, I can't believe that, that uh, what did happen uh, would have happened, but it wasn't. There, but if I might interject, yeah. there's a revealing uh, uh, sentence or two in President Carter's memoir uh, where he talks about how angry he was at his friends for taking the favors and invitations mm -hmm. that were given out by Taiwan. Uh, and it was almost, it, 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 was, it was a visceral anger. And he said, I lost friends over this. Yeah. And I think that there was a personal animus uh, yeah. that from that uh, on the part of the president. Yeah, I would, wouldn't be surprised. Um, I'll just tell you one story. Yeah, it, it, the debate in the lobbying was tough, and some of it was nasty, and some of it was pretty scary. Uh, I had one near-death experience, and I'm absolutely not exaggerating, uh, because I, I did the press and PR. Jim Pristop at NDU. Jim actually did most of the hard work and met with Carl uh, a lot, and, and if you really want to know about the, the defense debate internally, call Jim. If you want to know about the PR and the, and the, uh, and the uh, stuff out front, talk to me. Uh, there had been something that had been publicized so that Walter Judd and Madam Chang were very aware 
of what uh, one C. Nelson was doing uh, to help uh, the Chairman Wolf do whatever we were doing. And I came out of his office uh, in the Rayburn building and started to turn right down the main hall and I saw Walter Judd and Madame Chang coming down the hall <laughs> looking for me. And it was a scary thing because they were tough, smart, rough people. Uh, I turned around and went back and went out the back door of the <laughs> office. But I mentioned that a lot of people got the personal treatment and it, it, it enlivened uh, uh, things. And if you remember Walter Judd, uh, remember on his best day, he was a pretty scary dude. Um, let's see. I think an example of how the State Department just didn't get it until Harvey Feldman, a hero to everyone on Taiwan and should be, and a hero to all of us. Uh, Harvey was a great guy who was in on the joke, uh, but had, had uh, a really tough moral center. Uh, Harvey, I think, probably did as much as anybody to explain to Dick Holbrook and Warren Christopher, you know, your, uh, your original idea is the Taiwan Enabling Act. We've kind of forgotten that's what it was called. And Lester Wolf and others explained, you know, enabling doesn't quite cut it. That ain't what we're talking about. And the, the Taiwan Relations Act, the, the title we all take for granted now, that was a fight in itself. Mm. State Department wanted an enabling act, whatever the hell that meant. I'm not sure I remember. Now, um, Carl mentioned senators who were enormously helpful. Let's not forget Alan Krantz. Uh, the other day, I had a chance to talk to Lester Wolf. Uh, say, boss, what do you remember? Uh, he felt that we had a partnership with Ted Kennedy uh, and that the arms uh, uh, sale language that became the, the, the key to it uh, in the conference committee and in the final result, that that was largely a result, now this was Lester's memory, of course, uh, of what he had done with Kennedy and Kennedy's staff, who I'm pretty sure was Joyce Shub at the time, uh, having worked uh, with our uh, Joyce preceded me as the China person uh, uh, with Lester. So uh, uh, let's not forget the incredible uh, role played by, uh, by Kennedy. Also, uh, Senator Cranston uh, and Senator Javits, uh, my wife was working for him at that point. Uh, I've got to tell you a Javits story. I can't resist this. Uh, Javits is one of the great senators in American history and certainly in the 20th century. Uh, he was really into policy and really that's what he did, and that's what you were supposed to do. Uh, my wife uh, uh, was within two weeks of giving birth to Anthony Nelson, who many of you know at the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, uh, when she left Javits' staff. Javits always gave, a, uh, gave you a farewell handshake and photograph. And Jan came in there looking like, uh, you know, the San Francisco uh, coming into port. <laughs> And he looked at her and he said, honey, why are you leaving my staff? Uh, you know, it never occurred to him that you would, you would actually leave uh, working for Senator Javits to merely have a, have a child. Anyway, uh, uh, I have to tell you that story. It, 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 a great man. Um, I've already talked, remind you about Harvey Feldman. Um, one of the, the, the fights that took place that was so interesting was, uh, and I'm glad uh, 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 Carl mentioned Senator Pell, because our friend Mike Fonte over here reminded me uh, uh, of the critical role that people like Senator Pell and Steve Solars and Jim Leach had played in getting language in the Taiwan Relations Act that we tend to forget about, and that's the human rights language, and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute if I haven't already talked to you to death. Uh, now, I had a homework assignment. Uh, the letter that I got from Bonnie and Richard and Chris actually asked me to do something, and, they, and not just blather at you. Um, my assignment was to talk about the successes and failures of the act, and are we happy about that? So I'm gonna uh, do some of that. I hope I don't uh, run too much out of time. Um, the, the successes are obvious. We've had 35 years without conflict, uh, although it's been tough sometimes. Uh, overall, cross-straits ties are uh, as strong as they've ever been, really never better. Uh, the Taiwan economy is chugging right along. Uh, and and uh, as we've been saying all morning, by God, Taiwan is a real democracy. You know, the term vibrant is used. Uh, I'm not sure if we were any more vibrant, it wouldn't explode. But, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's an enormous success in that sense. Uh, I'm not sure I buy the notion of failures, but there's some things that are, are not so good uh, and, the, and troublesome. Uh, there's no question that Taiwan's official isolation remains a big problem. And, uh, we were kind of hoping that something could work out there. 
uh, uh, but the successive administrations, whether or not they were hostile, has never really been able to solve the riddle of what to do with Taiwan's membership in uh, international organizations where state status is required. Yeah, we, we, you know all these issues, and we'll talk about them today. ECFA, um, the economic stuff. It's good, uh, obviously. It's also potentially bad because its success deepens uh, the mainland's leverage, but not necessarily Taiwan's, although the ambassador today has made a very good case for, for, for more Taiwan's leverage uh, with the mainland uh, with the importance. So let's, uh, let's hope that that does give some, some balance. Um, let's see. I want to talk about arms sales in a minute. Um, how much more time do I have? Oh dear, because, because uh, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal a minute and a half, all right? Um, what's the biggest problem, the biggest disappointment? Uh, and I asked Chairman Wolf that, and he said the first thing is how, how disappointed he is that arms sales have become such a political football. And really, they've, they've been from the start. And it, I don't know about you, but it drives me crazy because, because it, you see this happen all the time. Some friends of Taiwan, maybe on Capitol Hill, maybe not, get into their head that Taiwan needs this weapon or that weapon. And a huge lobbying campaign gets ginned up. All kinds of pressure gets put on the administration of the moment about it. And uh, it becomes suddenly a measure of do you love Taiwan? Are you support Taiwan? You know, the issue of do they really need the weapon? Maybe or maybe is irrelevant. Sometimes it finally gets approved. Sometimes it finally get, gets through. And then what happens? The OI doesn't approve the money for the damn sale. And you've shed all kinds of blood to get there. It, this doesn't happen all the time, but, but the, the weapons thing is, a, is, is a constant problem. Uh, and we've never handled it very well, we being both of us. Uh, and that was, the, that was Lester's first point. Um, now, so uh, to the key question of my assignment, uh, this is how I defined it. Uh, does the Taiwan Relations Act provide legal backing and the tools needed to allow the U.S. and Taiwan to cooperate to meet the political, economic, and security challenges now arising and likely to accelerate uh, over the next few years? And I think the answer is yes, it does. Uh, so that's got to be a huge, huge success. But the arms sale is, is difficult. Question that obviously arises from that. Uh, does China's uh, decision to use military coercion to secure historical territory and maintain resources put the U.S. and Taiwan on a collision course uh, that the uh, Taiwan Relations Act just, just doesn't uh, cover? Again, that's not this uh, panel, but uh, uh, that's a potential, uh, not failure, but difficulty that arises. Um, but here's something that, that, again, I'm grateful to Mike Fonte for pointing this out to me. You know, at the end of the day, it may not be the arms and the defense treaty that uh, th uh, implications uh, that uh, is the critical factor, but it's possibly likely to be the human rights language, uh, section 2C, is it? Uh, that, that is uh, uh, the, the the real bedrock of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship in the future, and also in some ways uh, a, legi a, a legal legislated by Congress uh, uh, prohibition against uh, this administration or any administration walking away from Taiwan. You know, forget the arms sales. Uh, the human rights uh, of the people on Taiwan is the critical. Now, finally, uh, 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 when you're looking at, at, at successes and failures. The Taiwan Relations Act can't make people do the right thing or make the right decisions, but it does provide them uh, the framework to do it. Uh, I have a personal recommendation, which you're going to indulge me in because this is my talk. I would love to see the leadership of Taiwan resolve to have domestic political rivalry stop at the water's edge. I would love to see a unified KMT TPP staffing in tech world. I think that might help uh, a lot of things. Uh, might also just transfer the fighting to here, but, but uh, uh, I think the divide and conquer uh, uh, problem uh, is huge and, and we need to, uh, to, to deal with it. Finally, and last but not least, Dave, uh, Dave Keegan is here, I believe. Dave, where are you? It's over there. There. Did a great, you know, among the, the many, many papers that have been put out, uh, that are terrific. I, I really love Dave's, the Taiwan Relations Act, still such a change. He asks a lot of key questions. 
uh, but he makes a recommendation that is very interesting and potentially uh, uh, not clear. Washington needs to integrate Taipei more clearly into its China policy, including U.S. security planning for China's maritime periphery. Well, you know, in many ways, the Taiwan Relations Act goes to the heart of how we're going to deal with those issues. So we'll see. So okay, thanks. Carl thank you. Ford had a two finger. Yeah, just, just one, uh, one insight at how long and art the the, the, the the State Department, Senate, executive branch, legislative branch issue didn't stop uh, after the first year. It kept going. And as I think most of you remember, at the beginning of the Reagan administration, uh, the Chinese made another run at arms sales. And uh, the State Department came to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, indicating uh, that they had agreed that arms sales would eventually stop. Uh, and that the president had agreed to that. And uh, this was... Uh, Senator, Senator Helms jumped up uh, and, and said, no, Reagan didn't say that. He wouldn't have said that. And he ran out of the room and he went directly to the White House. And Gaston Siegel was given a note that he signed. I think Gaston wrote it. I call it the addendum uh, to the agreement that said arms sales will be balanced. If China uh, capabilities increase, arms sales to Taiwan can increase. And it was very much different than what had been agreed to in that agreement. And again, it was the differences between the view of the State Department and the Senate, at least, on those particular issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, to turn, um, our final presentation Oops, from Ambassador you're, David Lee. Okay. You're right. Your feet uh, are on the wire. 35 oh. years ago. I was a graduate student at uh, the University of Virginia. The normalization announcement uh, came at the end of the fall semester. Even though it was expected, it still came as a great shock to all of us from Taiwan. Out of uh, patriotism, I decided to take uh, a semester off and uh, went to Washington. By the time Deng Xiaoping came to visit, so we organized uh, 15,000 students uh, across the East Coast to demonstrate outside the Lafayette Park and express the, our defiance. Uh, I also like to mention there is uh, another active uh, student organizer who is president in this room, who is my good colleague and friend, Dr. Lu Xin Shen. <laughs> <laughs> Soon after, I was drawn to the congressional hearings on the proposed omnibus bill, the intricate uh, legislative process that unfolded before my eyes absolutely fascinated this foreign student. <laughs> so I knew what I had to make this as my doctoral dissertation topic. Today, as I look back at what took place three and a half decades ago, it is still a sensitive and emotional subject with a tremendous implication for Taiwan and the security of uh, Western Pacific. I'm uh, greatly honored at the invitation from uh, prestigious CSIS and uh, Brookings to offer my personal reflections today on the historic significance of this uh, important piece of uh, legislation. The goal of the legislation was uh, to facilitate continuing U.S. relations with Taiwan in the post deregulation era. The State Department lawyers felt that an executive order wouldn't pri provide enough of legal basis to withstand possible challenges in court and uh, would not comply with the Congressional Appropriation Authority. Only congressionally approved legislation could meet the legal requirement of this unprecedented new relationship with Taiwan. So an omnibus bill was uh, submitted by the Carter administration to the Congress in mid-January. The bill was uh, hastily drafted due to time constraint and the depressing events, the Christmas and the New Year holidays, 
the preparation for Deng, Xiaop Deng Xiaoping's forthcoming visit and the negotiations with Taiwan on the new relationship all consume the time and energy of uh, uh, the officials involved. Both uh, the big new Brzezinski and Michael Oxenberg admitted that the administration paid a price for the secrecy of uh, normalization negotiations, especially on the Taiwan legislation. Brzezinski described the early weeks of uh, 1979 as uh, especially frenzied and the blame lack of adequate planning and preparation for the eventual votes of the omnibus uh, bill. Oxenberg also wrote the drafting process did not receive the total care it deserved. As expected, the administration bill was heavily criticized when it reached Capitol Hill. Senator Frank Church, the Foreign Relations Committee chairman at the time, commented that uh, the most glaring deficiency was the failure to provide a statement concerning the future of Taiwan. On the House side, Republicans uh, introduced a resolution that included uh, reinstating the Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, Chairman Clayman Zablocki of uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee vowed that his committee would significantly revise the omnibus bill through the deliberation process. The outcome was uh, a complete surprise to liberals and conservatives alike. The liberals had feared that the issue would provoke the conservative coalition and the China lobby to draft resolutions or amendments that would compel a presidential veto and thus hinder the new relationship between U.S. and the PRC. The conservatives uh, were astonished that the liberals like Frank Church and Jacob Javits could speak up so firmly for the security of Taiwan. The success of the TRA should be contributed to the spirit of realism among members of Congress that was uh, prevalent throughout all stages of uh, legislative process. At every point, they were cautious to coordinate with and accommodated the concerns of their congressional colleagues in order to forge consensus. In essence, most of the major players in the legislation exercised discretion to find a path that would fit national interest and meet the moral responsibility of the United States toward Taiwan. This involved blending moral principles with political reality. The virtues of uh, moderation and prudence were prevalent at every stage of uh, the deliberation over the Taiwan Relations Act. In my view, the crowning achievement of the TRA is evident in the masterful ambiguities created by its architects. Several of them admitted that uh, some sections of the bill were deliberately made ambiguous. This would allow future presidents and congresses ample leeway to make decisions according to changing circumstances. It is not surprising then the TRA has withstood the challenge of time. In my view, this law has a special significance in two areas. The first is the security provision of uh, Section 3. This has played an active and positive role in helping maintain the independence and integrity of Taiwan under the jurisdiction of the government of Republic of China. The second is the legal protection provided in Section 4, which is indeed as significant as the security provision of Section 3. This legal protection has allowed the trade and investment ties as well as relations in other areas between Taiwan and the U.S. to continue to flourish. On the Taiwan side, TRA was highly regarded and acclaimed by the government and people 35 years ago. It provided a big morale boost at the nadir of uh, deregulation, 
and help to soothe feelings of anger and betrayal at the start of the post-normalization era. The security provisions and uh, the continuing application of US law to Taiwan further provided assurances to maintain Taiwan's integrity and enhance the confidence of both the government and the business community. The TRA was a consolation prize for Taiwan following the tumultuous uh, months during which uh, both Taiwan and the American government harbored a deep suspicion and grudges against each other. Lamentably, this mutual mistrust lasted throughout the remainder of uh, the Carter administration. I would argue that uh, TRA, in fact, laid the foundation 35 years ago for subsequent developments that leaders on the two sides of the Taiwan Strait could barely have foreseen. If it gave uh, President Jiang Jingguo a sufficient feeling of uh, security to embark on the democratization reforms of the 1980s and allowed an impressive 8.3% GDP growth rate for Taiwan throughout the entire post-normalization decade. The story was uh, quite different on the other side of the Taiwan Strait. Deng Xiaoping was criticized for not having been tougher on the US during the normalization negotiations. Deng was also furious about the political impact of the TRA which made his dream of ending the civil war and reunifying the country far more difficult and ultimately impossible during his lifetime. Then later lamented to former British Prime Minister Edward Heath in 1983 that the TRA was an even greater problem for Beijing than US arms sales to Taiwan. With the TRA standing in the way of uh, reunifying the motherland, Beijing pragmatically started to soften its tone and to extend olive branches to Taipei. I believe this uh, was the harbinger of uh, the cross street rapprochement that we are witnessing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have a uh, little time, time for, for questions. questions. Um, uh, a couple of guidelines. Once I recognize you, um, please wait for the mics. Um, identify yourself um, and to whom you wish to pose your question. Who would like to ask the first question? Joe Donovan, chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan. <laughs> Do we have a mic? Mic? Oh, here, come right here. Thanks. Joe Donovan, the managing director Sorry, of AIT man. Washington, <laughs> and my Sorry. chairman is sitting Apologies. off to my right and is about to, about to fire me. Um, my, my question is to David and to Carl. If you could talk a little bit about uh, Senator Helms's role in the formation of the, of the TRA, which I think in David's book is actually a very, very interesting topic. Well, my, my observation was it was not very much because he very quickly uh, was taking the position that he wanted to turn back normalization. And that was uh, Senator Church, Senator Javits were clearly directing the committee towards figuring out a way to protect Taiwan after normalization. And so that all of the discussion, he, he really didn't take much part in because he was anti this, anti that. And so uh, as I recall, that he and his staff really didn't participate that much in the sort of the backroom uh, drafting and discussions that we had. Uh, in fact, the, the, he had a greater role, as I suggested, uh, when he intervened uh, in what was 82 yeah. uh, and talked to President Reagan and Reagan uh, gave Gaston Seeger a, 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 a written document that I, I, we used to threaten state with. Gaston would go, well, I, I've got it in my safe. You know? <laughs> uh, but that, that was the only, it was much more of a role later on than it was at, in the beginning. I concur with Carr. As a matter of fact, uh, I think uh, both uh, Senator Helms and uh, Senator Goldwater 
did not play as an uh, active role in the crafting of the legislation as uh, we expected. Hmm. I, saw, uh, I think I, that, uh, for instance, uh, Senator Goldwater was uh, concentrating on challenging the legal status of uh, ending the mutual defense treaty instead of uh, uh, working on the, uh, on the deliberations of uh, TRA. The, the China lobby that, that the executive branch had been so afraid of just fell apart. Yeah. They just ran headlong into reality, mm -hmm. in a sense. It, it, even people who were not thrilled really about easy. dealing with the communists had this fascination with China and recognized the importance of China. I remember uh, there was a young man uh, with uh, the Taiwan Embassy uh, uh, that you may remember, John Feng, a uh, really <laughs> smart, very smooth guy. And I remember very early on saying, John, you know, we all feel really badly about this, but you can't make us go China to Taiwan. You can't. I mean, the, you know, we just got to face reality. And I think uh, in their hearts, most members sort of understood that. Uh, I forgot to say one good thing uh, about Chang uh, uh We really are, should be grateful to that man for his, uh, his grasp of the need for democratization and the skill with which he, he helped uh, make it happen. And you know, if you had asked me at the time back in 78, 79, is he gonna end up being the, in some ways, the founding father of Taiwanese democracy, I would have said, come on, what are you smoking? But it, you know, it happened under him, and let's always remember uh, uh, you know, when they're building the monuments and putting uh, things on the plaque, let's do that. Uh, and in my self-imposed question, does the Taiwan Relationship Act give you the framework necessary to confront the challenges? And it relates to this human rights uh, uh, part. Chang Jingo, I'm pretty sure, said, you know, in the long run, being a democracy is going to be a better defense for us. Uh, I, can, I can kind of remember that quote. Uh, and its, its relevance today may well turn out to be, uh, does it give us the framework to handle Taiwan identity and what we're going to do about Taiwan identity and how that relates to uh, 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 events as we go forward. It's uh, not inconceivable that the DPP will be back in power in a few years. How is the mainland going to react to that? Uh, how are we going to react to the mainland's reaction? You know, if you're looking at Putin in the Crimea and you're looking at what the Chinese are doing with our Vietnamese friends at the moment, there's reasons to be worried. So uh, again, that's not the topic for this panel, but the Taiwan Relations Act does give you frameworks to discuss some of these things and deal with it. Another question? Um, we'll go here and then to Mike Fonte. Back in the back, in the middle of the mic. Uh, Ken Wang from TBAA. Uh, my question is uh, about in year 2000, uh, in the U.S. House ha have a vote with uh, 340 and 70, passed a Taiwan Security Enhancement Act. That was passed by the House. And last year, they have a TPA, Taiwan Policy Act. So my question to the panel is, uh, is it possible they have like, a new replacement to the TRA. Thank you. Any views? Mm. Well, I would think that, that David's comments are, are appropriate here, and that is that the TRA, uh, obviously I have a certain uh, pride of authorship uh, as a minor player. Uh, the Chinese, I think, have had more trouble with the TRA uh, than they have, as they said, arms sales. Uh, and uh, that framework has what has established the, the, the ability of Taiwan to become the country it is today. And so I, 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 would, I would hope that Taiwan doesn't want, doesn't want it to change, that assurances mm -hmm. from America are fine, uh, but replacing it, uh, replacing the TRA, I think, would be a huge mistake. This is maybe a bad analogy, but you know, there's a reason for fast-track TPA in trade <laughs> negotiations. You know, you kind of need to have your 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 structure uh, and your instructions pretty firm because if you do a trade negotiation without TPA fast-track, at the end of the day, USTR and the White House they've done their job, and they go back to Congress, and by the time it comes out, you don't recognize what the hell you you started with. Uh, my advice would be don't mess with the TRA. Uh, you know, there's enough flexibility in the languages there. You don't need to do it. You may need to tweak how you always interpret it as you do with the American Constitution. Well, as uh, American cliche goes, uh, if he ain't broke, why fix it? <laughs> um, Mike Fonte, right here. 
Uh, thanks for the panel. Mike Ponte, I'm the DPP director of the, uh, director of the DPP office here in town. Uh, Chris, I think Lester Wolf's volumes on background to the, to the Taiwan Relations Act really stand me in good stead, and I would suggest that everybody here read them because it provides a lot of the back and forth that went on on the floor. Yeah. And one piece that went on the floor a lot uh, was Senator Glenn's interpolation of Christopher about various pieces of the, the diplomatic recognition. And one thing that you've pointed to, but I obviously would like to highlight, <clears throat> is the point that we recognize the PRC, but we only acknowledge their position about Taiwan. Taiwan is not, not recognized by the United States as part of the PRC, certainly, or part of China, it says. So I think if you could play that out a little bit, Carl, about Senator Ford did a lot of pushing on, on Christopher and the hearings. And I think that point was really one of the key points, not necessarily about the TRA, but about the relationship. Well, uh, yeah, I, my sense was that I'm, I was expressing uh, the anger and the distrust that the senators had. Uh, they were clearly uh, caught by surprise. Uh, they, the, there were attempts with wordplay, for example, the administration kept talking about weapons of a defensive nature, and the senators would just go crazy. Uh, you know, the, 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 what is a defensive weapon? And they, would, and they made it clear. They, they wanted weapons that would defend, the weapons necessary to defend Taiwan. So they didn't trust State Department. They didn't trust Jimmy Carter. And this was not just Republicans. There was as many Democrats as Republicans who didn't trust Jimmy Carter as far as they could throw him, and that wasn't very much. <laughs> and it was that, right. that atmosphere in which this, this, this TRA was made. And if it had been left up to the administration, it would have been a much different bill. It, it, would, it, it would have not been anything like what we see today. And I don't think it would have provided the background or the framework for Taiwan's uh, economic success. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I was an intern in Washington in 1966, so I've been here a long time. Uh, Jimmy Carter's administration to this day has the worst congressional relations operation I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, to me, it's a miracle anything got done, because uh, those guys couldn't find, never mind. Uh, uh, but that was also a, a real problem. Um, I would say, in some defense of the Carter administration, that they were, they were um, extremely afraid that if the word got out, yeah. that the whole mm -hmm. uh, project would be sandbagged and undermined. And um, oh, stopped. on that, uh, no, no, no debate at all. Of course, uh, yeah, you can't have a press conference to announce what you're going to do in two weeks that would be this controversial. Of course, mm -hmm. but I have to tell you, uh, my chairman Lester Wolf, who had been intimately involved, as I said, to have to be told by Dick Holbrook, turn on the TV at six and, and wait, that really, that really ticked him off. <laughs> Um, Ray Burkhart, the real chairman of the American yes. Institute in Taiwan. <laughs> to whom all praise is due. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should say that uh, Richard was, was the chairman when I was the director in Taipei, <laughs> and uh, sure. very lucky, especially considering some of the alternatives that came, uh, came <laughs> both before and after him. Yeah. Um, when, I, when some, some, somewhat of a follow-up on Mike Fonte's question, in looking back at some of the legislative history, sort of in preparing for this uh, meeting, I noticed that uh, something I had not seen before, which was uh, the record shows that a number of the senators, including, I believe, Javits among them, uh, were very opposed to the term unofficial relations. And therefore, in the act, it never uses that language. The language, I think there's a reference I, I saw somewhere in footnotes saying that the, the term unofficial relations was used in the Carter administration's announcement. Mm -hmm. But, but it, it, it was definitely not a, not, not a term that the senators themselves liked uh, or allowed to be used in the act. I was wondering a little commentary on that, what might be interesting. And a second sort of question, a legislative history question, um, the commitment to sell arms and to continue to sell arms is quite an explicit commitment in the act. The commitment to respond to an emergency in the Western Pacific is, is, a, is a more ambiguous commitment. And there is, I don't remember the precise language, but there's language in there about 
about in accord with, with constitutional procedures. Um, you reminded us that all this came in the wake of the War, of the war Powers Act, uh, to, uh, or in the time of the War Powers Act discussion. So I've always sort of thought that language probably was colored by the War Powers Act uh, concerns in the Congress. Uh, so I'd be also be interested in some sort of uh, historical reflections well, on I, that. Thank I, you. I think that's absolutely true. And remember, Javits was the uh, was the author, the godfather of the War Powers Act. So, he, and given his role, absolutely there. But uh, uh, Ray, as you were talking, I remembered uh, something uh, during the Chen Shui Bian administration. Uh, the, very, the very interesting spectacle of then Deputy Secretary of State Bob Zellick testifying to then Chairman Jim Leach uh, that after some particularly uh, interesting uh, Chen remarks, I think to the German press and among others, uh, you know, uh, if uh, actions by uh, Taiwan were to be seen as the cause of uh, the Chinese use of military force, uh, Taiwan could not necessarily count on the United States to come to its defense. Well, you know, this is a Republican administration uh, speaking to the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, that was a pretty sobering remark. And, uh, uh, but it, if, you, if you parse it, it, it reminds you of, in a sense, the same language that we have with the Mutual Defense Treaty with Japan. Uh, and that is it calls for consultations you know, it, it, uh, we tend to be a little glib talking about uh, a sort of automatic American sending in the Seventh Fleet to safeguard whoever and whatever, but it, uh, it's usually much more carefully phrased than that, and obviously uh, each time it's going to be more difficult. Carl, but, do you want to comment well, on that? Well, indeed, I think if you, if you look closely, every agreement that we have has that little phrase in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it's that wiggle room that our allies and friends focus on and look at very closely uh, and call us up uh, when <laughs> things like the Ukraine and or the Crimea Will happen. you be there? <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, no, I, I think that uh, the, 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 the senators wanted to talk about how to maintain a relationship with Taiwan. And uh, it, it was, I guess, the, the state and administration who were talking about un, unofficial religion. But they, they really didn't see it that way. Uh, if, if they could have had it to maintain a, 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 an official relationship, they would have. And they just concluded that they couldn't, and so they tried to make the best of that situation. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't because they were uh, accepting the notion that uh, it, the, the unofficial relationship was a, was a good thing. Yeah. Remember, I, I, I tried to stress, Taiwan Relations Act, that was our title, okay? Taiwan Enablement Act, that's what well, that state tried to slip through. And we just weren't going to buy it. Well, I think I concur with my mm -hmm. two panelist colleagues. Uh, and uh, as I recall that uh, the policy provision and uh, the arms sales uh, provision, I think those two subjects probably occupied uh, half of the debate during the deliberations. Mm -hmm. And certainly the Congress was under tremendous uh, pressure from uh, the administration against uh, adding stronger language so I think uh, what we have seen in the uh, section two and section three uh, were really the, the, the work, uh, I think, uh, the great compromise uh, reached by the both sides of uh, the administration and the Congress uh, together. Okay. Um, Steve, Steve Goldstein. Goldstein, and then I'll go to Garrett. I think what we've heard is the perspective from the uh, legislative side. I would just uh, suggest to everyone that the Carter papers are open, uh, that they should be read, that you'll find some very interesting information in there. I, I, I will tantalize <laughs> you. And let me just read you one, uh, what I hope will be a tantalizing piece. Uh, on the eve of the Carter announcement, uh, what we have in President Carter's White House di diary is Carter recorded that when he told Senator Byrd, this is on the 13th, mm -hmm. when he told Senator Byrd about Dung's acceptance of the draft communique, Byrd said, quote, 
any time I brief senators, it wouldn't be secret for more than five minutes. <laughs> so uh, I, they were, and, and, and if you read the whole drift of the uh, recognition uh, de debate within the administration, at every stage they are talking about Congress uh, and the need to prepare Congress, and they never get to it. Uh, and, and, and I think part of the reason that they never get to it is that the final recognition process, the last two weeks, was so hectic and so rushed uh, that a, a lot of things got lost. One was a, a, an, an almost di disastrous misunderstanding mm -hmm. uh, by Dung on arms sales mm -hmm. uh, that was largely our fault. They also forgot that there was going to be an election in Taiwan in late December. That's true. Well, uh, sorry. Uh, there, there also was a, the perspective of the, the administration really didn't change from administration to administration because during Bush one, uh, I'd already, I was at the Pentagon and I had been doing East Asia for the first two years, but I moved on to the Middle East. Uh, Jim Lilly had taken over as the assistant secretary and uh, President Bush went to Fort Worth and announced that he was going to sell F-16s mm -hmm. to Taiwan. Uh, and I, I can still remember the next day when the state said, we, we aren't going to do it. <laughs> when we said, well, you got it. This president's already announced it. And uh, uh, Glenn Rudd, who was the head of DSA at the time, came to me because he didn't know Jim that well. And he said, listen, they are buying this F-16 thing. He said, what you, talk to Jim about this. He said, what you can do is that tell them that, uh, make, it, make sure he understands that, uh, that the U.S. Air Force is making a midlife upgrade to the F-16 that makes it identical uh, to the F-16 uh, D and C. Uh, that it is not an A B when you get the midlife upgrade. But if you call it that, they won't know what it is. And Yes, we did. We sold them the F-16 midlife upgrade and State Department, okay, that sounded like a good solution. It was an F-16 CD in Bush 1, so. Okay. Garrett Van Der and this is our last question. <laughs> Thank you for an uh, excellent panel. Really enjoyed all the reminiscing. Uh, my name is Garrett Van Der Wees, editor of Taiwan Communique. And um, Chris' uh, point that you mentioned that Senator Pell and Kennedy and Jim Leach played such a crucial role in the human rights clause, and I'm really glad you mentioned that. There was, of course, also uh, Congressman Steve Solart, yes. mm -hmm. and we refer to them as the gang of four in Congress, and they played, I think, a pretty crucial role in the subsequent uh, transition to democracy in Taiwan. Yeah. Can, you, can you maybe elaborate a little bit of how this human rights clause played a role in that process afterwards? Yeah, I had a totally different perspective on that. Uh, the fact is that uh, right after that, Senator Glenn uh, was running for president. And so I was out, of, out among people trying to raise money uh, and so uh, I got a call uh, from both the Kennedy staff and uh, the Solar staff. Uh, in fact, I think I got it from Steve directly, uh, saying, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm talking to the, the native Taiwanese people. They got a lot of money. He said, you can't do that. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, they'll want you to say too much. And I said, well, that, Senator Glenn feels that way, so it's no problem for us. Well, you, you'll just have to live with it. And so there was a real reluctance on the part of, of the liberals on that committee to be for the human rights, yes, but pro-China to the bone. Uh, and so that if it, it came to native Taiwanese as opposed to China, China every time was my experience uh, with both Solar and with Kennedy staff. Yeah. Um, I can confirm that. I sort of looked into what Steve did on the TRA, and it was very little. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it was, the, the human rights part of it was really carried by, by Pell and Leach. That's right. And they got a lot less than they wanted. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, it wasn't until Steve became chairman of the Asia subcommittee that he right. took this on as a cause. Which they do. I asked Chairman Wolf about uh, Solars, actually, because uh, I couldn't remember. Uh, we're talking again, 78, 79, 80. Uh, and he said, actually, Steve was, it, was kind of against TRA, uh, and it was mainly on human rights ground. He just didn't think it was strong enough and didn't, and didn't trust. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're talking in the, in the early days. Obviously, then later on, uh, I, I had left the Hill by then. I was, I became, I was a Japanese businessman. Uh, but Richard was doing the, the hard work at that okay. point. Well, um, <laughs> thank you, Carl. Chris and David for some really oh. fascinating insights on a, the opportunity. on a time long past, but still very relevant to today. Um, it's uh, a reminder that um, legislation is like making sausage. Yeah. <laughs> you really don't want to know. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>